All right. Welcome to Networking Hour. Thanks for coming, everybody, in person and on the internet. Hi, Kim. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll be talking about value proposition design today, how to create products and services customers want. This is based on a book, um, Value Proposition Design, which is a follow-up to Business Model Generation. These are pretty revolutionary books for um, entrepreneurship uh, training. Business model generation put forth the business model canvas, which has, what is it, nine squares? Nine components. Um, of what makes up a successful business model and uh, put together some processes for testing these components of your business using lean launch methodology. However, the reason they wrote the follow up is because value propositions and customer segments, these two uh, squares are, are the most important. If those don't work, nothing else really matters. So then um, they came out with a value proposition design that uh, simplifies it down to those two. You focus on those first, and then once you have product market fit between value propositions and customer segments, then you can move on from there. So what's a value proposition? The thing you provide for your customers. All right, well, that's pretty good. The benefits the customer can expect from the product. So really this is, what are you delivering? What is the person uh, hoping to get out of the product when they buy it? So as far as value proposition design, this is the process of designing value propositions customers want. Basically designing products and services customers want. It's important, people buy your products and services. And it's pretty fundamental here. Um, the design process for, for value propositions is, is two, two segments um, and two steps. First one is observe and segment customers. This is where you really understand your customer and the specific customer type you're going after. And then step two is to create value. So with this in, all these insights you develop by identifying your customers, then you create value. You create a product that really meets the needs of that customer. So we'll go through each one of these. Um, some tools that you have when you're doing value proposition design is the lean startup methodology, which is basically like the scientific method, except applied to business. So you're making hypotheses about certain customers going to want a certain product, and then you test it through customer discovery and customer research. And you also have the value proposition design canvas, which is a, a way to hypothesize and test. So you've got these two steps. The canvas looks like this, uh, the one from the book. You've got value propositions with uh, these three segments, the products and services you want to offer, what are the game creators that you're going to provide to the customers and pain relievers. And then on the customer side, what jobs the customers are hoping to um, achieve with those products, and then the pain and gain. So we'll go into more detail about those. For our programs, we usually simplify the canvas down to just value propositions, customer segments. All right. So as far as observing and segmenting customers, um, the key definition here is what is a customer segment. This is a customer group characterized by three conditions. Customers that buy similar products, they have similar sales cycles, and value propositions, and then they interact, uh, meaning word of mouth. The reason this is important is because all these people could be sold um, similar products for the same reasons, using similar sales pitches, and also they'll start to share that information with each other. The reason you should segment your customers is it, is it allows for focus, simplifies your marketing messages, simplifies your product, and service design, and it makes your products and services more compelling to your target market. So here's a, here's a comment from Discipline Entrepreneurship. <coughs> it says, son, to become a great tennis player, you need to play a lot of tennis and be the best along the way. So then the kid's all excited, that's clear, I want to do that as soon as possible, I'll do that tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So he comes out here and then he's playing the best tennis players in the world, he's getting, he's getting crushed. Um, he basically bit off more than he could chew. So then, Come back and the advice is uh, patient and focus. Patience and focus. So rather than going after um, everything all at once, focus on a specific customer segment and then go from there. All right. Here for the networking hour. I am. Yeah, in the right is place. It, yeah. Is it uh, is it a public book? Oh yeah. Yeah. Come on. Just for the residents. Yeah. Come on. Nope. Come on. Okay. We got some pizza too, so I got some. Great. Thank all you. Right. All right, so, so when we really are, are talking about here with this uh, focus on a specific customer segment, um, is a beachhead market. And what we mean by that 
is this first market you're going to go after, after to be able to secure um, revenue to make your business sustainable. The origin comes from a defended position on a beach in enemy territory in which an attack is launched, the military definition. Uh, rather than you know, try to launch a bunch of attacks from the sea, secure beachhead, and then you scan through territory from there. So apply to business, it's a position in a market that a company achieves to make it stronger in the future. Really important concept, and this is a great place to start if you're launching a new product. Really thinking about who that beachhead market's going to be. And when you're choosing this beachhead market, the things you want to think about are, can you compete? Your goal is to dominate this, this market, so you really want to understand who else is competing. And ideally, you, say, you, you target some segment of the population that's not being competed for by some larger companies, allowing you to compete effectively. You want to know how risky it is. We always say this, the, this first market's the hardest. Um, and the reason is, is because you're launching a new product um, to a new customer segment. Everywhere after that, you can launch um, your first product to a second customer segment, or you could launch a second product to that first customer segment. In any case, you either know the product or you know the customer segment. So there's less risk associated with that. Plus, you should be making money from your beachhead, so you have some sustainability there. Um, there's multiple paths to success, so don't get hung up on finding the perfect beachhead and, and, and get stuck in this paralysis analysis. Um, but it is important to really consider a, a good beachhead when you're launching a new product. Um, some examples, um, you can see a lot of big companies use beachhead markets to get started and also to expand and launch new products. Um, if you think of Tesla, they're trying to enter really competitive auto industry that's extremely capital intensive. And so rather than go and launch some car that was an electric car that competed with the Toyota Camry, they targeted a niche that was uh, much higher end and provided the capital to then expand um, once they were able to, to target that niche. So they're going after people that are um, concerned about the environment but maybe didn't want to, they want something more sporty than Prius. Um, they're willing to pay money for it. And so they had a high end, super efficient sports car allowed them to raise the capital, dominate this new niche that they basically created, um, and expand from there. Um, you think about Apple, um, they didn't just jump into the phone market or the handheld device market first, they launched the iPod. Um, to enter the handheld device market, they built the expertise and then that was a transition to the iPhone after they worked out all the bugs and, 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 and made it work. You see some of those iPod touches before the iPhone came out, it was basically the same device, but they got all this use. They didn't um, launch their first product into the phone market to find out that you know they had some problem and lose all the credibility. They really built the expertise first. And they did that through a, a beachhead where they knew they could, uh, could dominate. Um, Google focused on search market exclusively for, for at least five years um, at the beginning when they launched their company. They wanted to dominate the search market and then they expanded it into more other markets. They used a beachhead market strategy too. And by securing a really strong beachhead, they've been able to enter pretty much everything from there. Facebook started with college students rather than targeting everybody. They targeted college students because that addressed the issues of other social networks and uh, it made Facebook an ominous player. I mean, the other issues being that identities weren't, um, you didn't really know the identity of people on MySpace and things like that. So um, by tying it to a university email. They overcame that and uh, that allowed them to be a dominant player. Walmart started from one store in a local community, expanded through Arkansas regionally and beyond. And they didn't go after everybody all at once. They gradually expanded and built their logistics chain through that. Southwest Airlines started with low-cost regional flights. They built their operational efficiencies and, um, and demand to expand from there. Can you guys think of any other beachhead market examples or companies that have used beachhead markets to launch new products or startups? Netflix. Netflix. So what was their beachhead? Beachhead was just the the the, the movies, and then they would you'd send them back and get more. And now they've gone from taking that out to streaming and to yeah. on demand. So that first market was some people that had big problems with late fees and had, had regular rental stores, and then from there expanded into much broader audience. Any others? Amazon, probably for you. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Started with books. Yeah. 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 That's a good example. PlayStation and started with games, and now they're moving into television. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So by securing that first thing, then they're in a position because they got the cash flow from you know books or games that could then um, expand another market. I think Amazon didn't have the cash. They probably still don't have the cash flow. <laughs> that was, I think half the They've time. Got the I think half, half the time this whole like uh, I love Beachhead's market concept and all that, but it almost just seems like uh, they they just happen upon this strategy by necessity. You know, they just start off. I don't know if a lot of them do it premeditated. Maybe they do well, now. I, I mean, think about it, if, if, if you're Amazon and you want to eventually have the marketplace for the entire online world, right? Or you just want to stay in business. You yeah. You just expand and, you know, and expand. Well, but I, I believe there was that broader vision for what Amazon could become. That's why it's not named like bookfinder.com or something like that. Um, but they chose books because those don't expire. Um, there was a lot of inventory for those things. There was a used market that, that, that works. Um, you could easily categorize it. So, I mean, I think there was a lot of homework there of why you chose books and not something else that didn't hold its value or there was no used market for it. Something that couldn't, couldn't be stored as easily. Anything that would spoil or expire. So, I mean, there was, there was some thought that went into that. I'd have to think so. And, I mean, even if they, they happened on it by accident, um, it worked. And, I mean, it was the key to their success. Was, um, I mean, if you just think of what Google is able to control by controlling the search market, you basically know when anybody wants to find something on, on the web. What well, I think they're actually searched. a better example of that. Yeah. You know, because it, I don't think that um, Sergey and Paige came in thinking that they're going to do robotics. Yeah, folk, yeah, that they're going to expand into like everything that yeah. they've expanded into and control the world, but first start with the beach and <coughs> search. I mean, their focus was search, and that's all that was on their mind at that time, even though they were thinking about all sorts of different things. That was their product. Yeah. Eventually, it became so dominant, and they were cash flow. They didn't even know how to monetize it at first. Yeah. You know, that wasn't a genius strategy uh, at the onset. They just knew that they didn't want banner ads, and, you know, they knew certain things. But it all sort of fell into place, and then it became this cash giant that yeah. took them into all these other markets. But that wasn't thought, you know, yeah. uh, in advance. That wasn't pre-designed. It just sort mm-hmm. of was fortuitous and just emerged. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, obviously, you don't know what everything's going to yeah. become, but um, you're going to have a lot more success if you do focus on some beachhead rather than try to pursue a bunch of stuff. Oh yeah, yeah. Awesome. I think the beachhead's great. Yeah, I think that's the primary primary lesson. Yeah. yeah. This method might not be known by the people like. Google, Apple, and everything, but this method will be useful for people who are going to start it because it's an experience. You know, like we can see back, yeah, like Google, Apple, even yeah. though they don't know that's a WeChat method, yeah. but they have done it. That like it can be a great example to the startups who can you know concentrate on one thing right now, yeah. though they want to concentrate on many things. Mm-hmm. So focus on one thing, and they can go up later. Yeah. So this thing can be implemented right over the startups during this generation. Yeah, yeah, and I think like the method of like kind of your example with like Amazon, like. If we think back to the early 2000s, there were tons of like online stores that were trying to probably want to be more than what they were, you know, and their failings were probably a lot of them to your points of like inventory, sortability, um, you know, just have, being able to have this without expiration. So they definitely chose the right approach, whether it was by accident or, you know, you know I think your, your point of we can still learn from it and employ it. No, like, I, I think you got a good point that like sometimes maybe a stumble onto the right beach and it turns out to be yeah. a good one. Right, well, and I think to your comments, you know, you hit the nail on the head from my point of view, is I think a lot of these examples just sort of happen, but now in retrospect, we can look back at them as models, yeah. and that uh, this, this, this model, this beachhead concept is, I think, uh, you know, a, a huge value, yeah. you know, it's definitely uh, something that I'm a, I'm a huge fan of now, mm-hmm. but I think these examples just sort of hit upon it, and now we get to benefit off of you know, looking back and, and having a, you know, having like a, just a retrospective, a retrospective um, sort of take on it now. Mm-hmm. All right, so we got the beachhead market concept. Next steps how to how to really identify these these customer segments. Um, and the best way uh, we found to do it is is a framework called Jobs to Be Done. It's based on the idea that customers hire products and services. Jobs. 
comes out of a HBR article from the 1960s. Um, it's called Marketing Myopia. And it put forth this concept that people aren't buying um, the drill, they're buying the hole, right? The drill just happens to be the best way to get the hole wherever you want it, um, in your board of wood or your wall or whatever. Um, and so when you start kind of peeling back what is a product really doing, that job that it's accomplishing, uh, then you get a better insight into why people are buying that product. And so that's where the concept comes from. Um, say somebody buys a Honda Accord. What jobs are they trying to accomplish? Transportation. Okay. Efficient. Efficient. Reliability. Okay. What else? Good resale. Try cheap people. Yeah. Okay. Cheap magnets. Yeah. <laughs> on this one? What is somebody, what job is somebody trying to accomplish with this car? Speed. Speed. Status. Okay. Pyramid scheme. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all the pyramid scheme guys have Lambos. <laughs> <laughs> Just the natural revolution. Yeah, okay. Now what if somebody has uh, this car? What, what jobs are they trying to accomplish? Circus clowns. Circus clowns, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's what I think every time I see them. Okay, perfect. Easy parking. Yeah, easy parking. Yeah. All right, and so these are all cars, but you see that there's a lot of different jobs. Now then, what if somebody just decides to use Uber? What jobs are they trying to accomplish there? No maintenance and everything. Yeah, no maintenance. They don't own no. the car. Don't pay insurance. Access. You can get it right away. Yeah, no, no parking. And driving the traffic, just take it to sleep time. Mm -hmm. Want to drive? Less stress. Yeah. So, um, so, so the message here is that when customers shop, they compare all options to get the job done. And so these are some examples of transportation. A lot of different options would appeal to different customers. What you want to figure out is um, what customer segment is going to be attracted most to your, your product or services. So as another example, say it's a home improvement project. Um, you've got the option of maybe doing it yourself and taking the risk there to see if you can actually make that work. You can avoid the job and maintenance on your house. You can hire a pro, you can buy some tool. And why this is interesting is because these aren't really looked at as, as competing options, although when people make purchasing decisions, these are the options that they consider. So you really want to step back from that. that competition between one product and another to really compare all the options that the customers are going to be looking for. And so if you know the job your customer wants done, you can design the best job applicant, so the solution for them, and, and then market it fairly. I think this is another really interesting example. So Cindy's got this, uh, she's had a stressful day, and she's looking for some way to recover and feel better. Um, she could get drunk, she could drink a soda, she could go exercise, she could play some video games, she could uh, eat some ice cream, she could go to church, right? All these different things could help make her feel better or be some way to recover. And so this is her competitive set and it differs a lot from traditional competition, which is between brands and products. Um, and so I think this is a really powerful lesson about when people are considering solutions and ways to solve problems and things like that, they're really looking at a lot of different options. And all, and all those decisions take place before you even decide between Xbox or PS4. All right, and some of the foundations of this are basically people act for two reasons, to avoid pain, increase pleasure. And the reason you were concerned with how people act is if you're asking somebody to give you money and buy something and use a new product or service, you need to figure out what's gonna make them have any motivation to do that. So we think about these as pains and gains. Businesses act for four reasons, to really kind of boil down to making money. Make money, save money, save time, reduce risk. So these would all be gains. Pains for them would be lose money, waste money, waste time, uh, increase risk. Um, another tool to use, some of you may have heard, uh, you know, a lot of times your biggest competitor is the status quo, where people just basically are stuck in what they're doing and unless they have some big push, to get them to buy some new product or something like that, it's just not going to happen. And this explains the competing forces. So you've got um, business as usual, so what you're doing now, to a new behavior. 
you got the habit of the president, which is kind of always pulling you to just stay with what you're doing. That's easier. Um, then you've also got some anxiety about, is this new solution going to work? Is it going to waste a bunch of my time? Um, but then on the other side, you've got the push of, you know, maybe the status quo is not working for you. Maybe there's problems. And then maybe there's some new solution that's, that's really compelling. And so you, you want to kind of think through, what are these forces looking like for your customer segments? Uh, what's keeping them doing the status quo, and then what's going to draw them out to, to buy some new product or service? So this is a pretty interesting framework. This also comes from jobs to be done. Um, when you start talking about customer jobs, we can segment those into a couple different categories. Functional jobs are specific task or problem the customer's trying to solve. They're hiring this product to do a specific job. Mow the lawn, paint the house, schedule meetings. Social job might be how the customer wants to be perceived by others. So maybe they want to look wealthy, appear professional, look creative. Um, you've got personal and emotional jobs about how a customer wants to, wants to feel. Um, they want to feel secure, be able to relax, so forth. And you got supporting jobs that um, help them purchase and consume value by others. So um, like kayak.com aggregates a bunch of other sites and makes it easier for somebody that's just flight or something like that. Some examples. Um, and your product can address multiple jobs, and sometimes that's important for making it compelling for customers. So let's say a um, couple's buying a car seat for a newborn. Their functional job is help us keep our baby secure while she's riding the car. The emotional job, want to know our baby's safe and feel like we're getting good protective parents. And the social job might be we want to show couples you've got the best and safest baby gear. Right? So you, you, a lot of angles there. Um, can you guys come up with any examples of product or service that might address multiple job types? Yeah, like a college degree, okay. where, you, where you get your degree from, at what university, you know? Some folks just want the practical matters of being educated or, or you know, have a maybe a trade skill or a set, something like that. So be a functional job? Mm-hmm. But then, you know, going to the right school, quote unquote, you know, like Harvard or what have you, also does that, but it also adds a certain, you know, level of prestige, you know, mm -hmm. and, and tells other people around you, like, uh, that you come from wealth or that, you know, you have access to resources that others don't, things of that nature. Yeah, that's a good example. Country clubs. Yeah, oh, sorry. So cell phone? Yeah, yeah, yeah iPhone. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, the coolest phone, you got an Apple phone, and uh, it's also got functional pieces to it. Yeah, I think that's a really good example. It's true, when I had an Apple phone, I was getting way more dates. <laughs> <laughs> that's cute. Real social impact there. Yeah. Awesome. Social stickers. Yeah, I've seen uh, country clubs. Okay. You know, golf country clubs, there's lots of members uh, that are go they go there to socialize and to, you know, have a status symbol. Um, lots of people that don't even play golf are associated with country clubs because yeah. of the extra benefits that they get from it. So yeah. accomplish some of those social jobs. Definitely. And then functional jobs if you actually want to play. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there you go. All right, perfect. All right, um, when we look at customer pains, um, we got functional pains like this product doesn't work. Somebody looks bad doing it might be a social pain. Emotional pains would be I feel bad every time I do this. And ciliary pains would be it's annoying to go to the store for that. So you've got um, all kinds of ways that customers can have pain. And uh, there may be some obstacles um, that prevent a job from getting started. So skills, wealth, access, time, existing behavior. So you want to think about um, there's something that's preventing people from adopting your solution or being able to accomplish that uh, specific job. Risks could be a pain. And then you always want to think about pain severity, like how big of a problem is this for people. Um, usually we try to think about um, most people buy products for, to address one of the top two priorities they have for a specific situation. So if it's not a big, severe thing, people aren't likely to go spend a bunch of money on it. As far as gains, you've got required gains, which are like, it's just not acceptable not to have it. Like if you're buying a cell phone, it's gotta make phone calls. Um, and those required gains kind of move with technology, so maybe it's gotta have an app store or something like that. Might be a required gain for some people. 
expected gains that are basic but necessary. Uh, you can't really raise a price for these for, for customers to check them. Desired gains beyond what the customers expect and they'll love it and then unexpected gains. That the customers won't say they even want it but um, they may enjoy it. And so that might be a way to differentiate your product. So when we look at a product like this, what jobs are being addressed by the snake? Definitely not social jobs. <laughs> no social jobs? <laughs> Keeping moms warm, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, I mean, these SCM on TV do a really good job of marketing their, their value proposition. Keep you warm and your hands free. Right? So you can do two things at once. You can read a book, use your laptop, talk on the phone, all without getting out of your, your blanket. Right? The blanket that has sleeves. Um, so as far as a, a segmenting customers, um, key points here. Segment your customers based on their motivation for wanting your product. It's going to be way more accurate than classic segmenting by attribute. So if you think of, we've got, you know, 25 to 40 year old men versus homeowners looking to perform simple maintenance on their house. If you're if you've got a home improvement product, the second part, the second one's going to be much more accurate. All right. Some of these 25 to 40 year old men may not have a house, um, you know, so they may not have any interest in your, in your um, home improvement product. Circumstance is much more important than attributes. And then focus on uh, beachhead market first for first sale. And going back to why this is so important, if you think of demographics and how different people are across some of these classic demographic um, characteristics, got really different preferences and really different uh, problems they're facing and really different um, products that they buy. So you really want to focus more on that circumstance and the, those jobs that the customers are trying to accomplish. Any questions on segmented customers? Yeah, so we had demographics, then then we evolved to psychographics, but this whole circumstance concept seems like a new kind of um, concept, right? It's not psychographic anymore. It's more about like, what is that? What would you guys call it? Well, it's the jobs to be done. It's, yeah. it's uh, what are you buying that product for, mm -hmm. and what are you, what are you hoping to accomplish? Mm -hmm. so, and it's a lot more accurate. Yeah. Um, I think you could use the demographic variables if you had products that have really broad appeal. Um, but now, I mean, there's so many different products and different specialized interests and things like that. that if you're targeting a specific market, it's more important about why does that person want that product and the individual preferences. All right. Um, we'll move on to uh, creating value. So this is the second phase. Once you Identify the, the customers you want to go after. You've got some insights about what they want, the jobs they're trying to accomplish. Then the next step is create value, create a product or service that, uh, that they want. So in value proposition design, they go through, start with listing your products and services. Outline the pain relievers, so what's going to relieve pains for the customer. What are the gain creators? And then rank these in order of importance. So that priority, again, is, is really important. So for the products and services, list what you offer in terms of physical, tangible products, intangible, digital, and financial products. Again, in order organized by relevance and importance. Pain relievers, this is where you describe exactly how your product or service is gonna alleviate specific customer pain. What will reduce or eliminate things that annoy or bother the customer? Now, this is a really key point here. Addressing all pains is not necessary. Focusing on relieving a few pains extremely well can make for a great product or service. People generally make purchasing decisions based on their top two priorities, right? So you don't need to address everything um, that they they possibly would want. Focus on some specific ones, and then your products will be less uh, complicated and also a lot simpler to market. Game creators. So these are. Uh, how your product or service will produce outcomes that your customers expect, desire, or would be surprised by in terms of functional utility, social gains, positive emotions, and cost savings. Thinking back to those, those different job types. Um, another way to look at these jobs is um, somebody is complete, uh, trying to complete some job, there's a lot of steps that go into it. And so if you think of the anatomy of customer jobs, maybe you don't even need to address the whole job. 
Um, maybe you can focus on some piece of it, or you can use this analysis to <coughs> augment your solution to help somebody group all of what they're trying to accomplish. So you've got the first step, defining what the job requires, identifying the locating needed inputs, preparing the components in the physical environment, confirming everything's ready, executing the task, monitoring, making modifications, concluding the job, and then troubleshooting. So you can break those down into these different things. And so when you think of uh, examples here, like if you think of Ikea, they don't just send you into the warehouse to go find a bunch of uh, furniture and boxes. Um, they have example spaces. So you can start to even kind of define what you're looking for to really understand um, how some furniture might fit in, in, your, in your house. So that helps somebody buy furniture for their house. So they're, they're, they're getting them started with ideas of, of what might you buy, where would you, would you put this in the kitchen or the dining room, and so forth. Um, helping to locate the, the inputs, you know, just that, I don't think it was always this way, but it makes sense for U-Haul to sell boxes in the same place they rent moving trucks. Right? If somebody's moving, they're probably gonna need to buy boxes, and having that in the store just makes it really convenient for the customer. Um, Helping somebody uh, actually execute the job so Amazon one click might make it easier for some people to purchase. Uh, modify Amazon will let you modify orders um, after you place the order but before shipment. So the lesson here is that innovation can occur at any of these stages and then so can problems with pain. So if you understand what that is looking like to a customer, you can figure out how to have a more compelling product and serve their, their needs better. Um, we also talk about different types of innovation, that your, your company doesn't need to innovate everywhere. Um, but you can innovate on one of these three things and have really compelling products. Value creation is kind of the classic one, you got some new product or service. You can also innovate by having a new business model. And you can also innovate by just being able to market your product better through some unique promotional channels. And you can innovate on any one of these and build a compelling business. Because if you can promote better than a competitor, even if you got the same business model and product, your business can be more effective. And another tool, this comes from Jobs to be done, is the timeline of how a customer gets from awareness to an actual purchasing decision. And the way it's used is you're doing customer discovery and you're talking to customers that reached, recently bought products similar to yours, you try to fill out this, uh, this timeline. Uh, they bought the product here, right? What were the preceding events that led them from a first thought to passively looking for that product to actively looking to then deciding and eventually buying? And you can see that, you can figure out what were their hangups, what prevented them going through that sales process and making that decision quicker and where did they find out about it? Because you're going to try to take customers through this timeline to purchase your product. Um, some simple ways to think about this is uh, the customer decision making stages, awareness, interest, consideration, purchase, and how your customer is going to get through those, those phases to actually make the purchasing decision. All right, so let's go through an example for <coughs> The, putting this all together from the, the understanding of your customer to then creating a product. So let's say you're in the market for a new, new laptop. What jobs do you expect? Um, I'm just type it up. Expect from your new laptop. It has to be a full functional computer, right? Operating system? What do you mean by full functional? I mean, it has to basically operate as a computer would. Okay, so there's some requirements as to what a computer is going to be able to do, like, like what? Speed, run various software applications. Mm -hmm. Memory. Okay. Internet, internet access. Yeah, internet. Wi-Fi. Are those jobs, though, or are those just like functional attributes? Those are attributes of some sort that then result in what are, what are computers do? They compute, right? They yeah. have to be process. They run uh, software applications. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we can put a, a lot of those are going to be just required games, I guess you could say. 
Well, I don't know, like games would be like, um, it's super light, has a long lifespan, like energy, you know, battery life. Those are like super positive games, right? Make yeah. me happy, bring pleasure to me, right? And super uh, high definition uh, visual display. Right, it's good. Right, the pains would be, of course, like it's super heavy, or the battery light, you know, the opposites of those, like the battery's always running low. Fragility. Uh, it's not portable. It's fragile. Accessible devices would be a pain. What else do you look for when you're buying a laptop? Are there any pains, gains, job you're trying to accomplish? Is it affordable? Yeah. Am I priced? I mean, yeah, for me, like jobs just... I have to accomplish, I have to have something that basically would be able to process, uh, you know, like video and audio and stuff like that as quickly as possible without overheating. And that would make me happy. I think it, from my perspective, cars or uh, computers almost come become like a car in a good type where it's like A to B is the main point. So it's almost like internet accessibility and basic functionality for some programs are the main jobs mm -hmm. I want. Just like for my car, A to B is the main point. But beyond that, everything else is just gain opportunity. Oh, no, I thought it was like, let's take it in the other Yeah. I was like a user as well. I want to be able to buy it and still have it be worthwhile in yeah, four to three years. Yeah, four to three years. Am I able to hack government institutions? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so. <laughs> User friendly. Okay. That'd probably be a game, right? Yeah, that'd be a huge game. And I think it's interesting actually that these are different conversations if you're looking for a PC or a Mac. Mm -hmm. Well, a different customer is going to yeah. buy those for different reasons. Yep. Yeah. So then the next step of this, um, say we're Apple, we're creating products and services. What are our um, main, pain relievers and then the products or services? Pain reliever is it's based off a of Linux kernel, so it's more secure for viruses. If you're Apple. Nice. <coughs> I don't know, I think that's a myth now. I mean, it used to be true. But I mean, okay. I've been on Apple's forever, and back in the day, like, yeah, no viruses could touch it or what have you. Now it's just completely infected with the same sort of viruses that PC phones had. I didn't know it was the Linux no, piece. Like, I thought it had to do with usage, because, like, if you're going to create a virus, you want it to be online. You know I just think, I think really that the main factor was that, because, yeah, the open source Linux concept is just that it's more stable because it's open source and so forth. Is that what you're talking about? I've just always heard that the Linux kernel is more secure than what the no, I just think that like soft. I just think it was the fact that it really was still just a very small portion of the market of people that were on that platform utilizing it, and the rest of the world was on a PC platform. Dude, Apple can't even get into their own phones. You know? <laughs> so they say. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that'd be a pain reliever. Is that it's uh, virus secure? Yeah, but it's it's not a pain reliever. That the design actually, the Mac is a, like the design. Yeah, the design, user interface. As far as products, they've got the MacBook Air and then the MacBook. Pro. Right, in terms of laptops, right? Yeah. Pro, yeah. Air Pro. Oh, yeah, Pro. Cloud. Cloud? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, they do the iCloud. What are their games, uh, game creators and pain relievers? Does Apple offer a lot of Pain is money. <laughs> it costs too much. And compared to the other. Yes, yeah, so that's not a reliever. Yeah. It's, a it's more of a. It's a, a game would be a sort of status, I guess. Yeah. With an app. More dates. You know, more dates. Two or three times as much as other computers, <laughs> yeah. Because it's a pain, you know, like whenever like anything happens, the hack is gone, or like, you know. Anything, if you got any repair kind of thing, they charge you too much. 
like compared to that other PCs, mm-hmm. this costs more, you know, if, yeah. if you are not in warranty, or else in, even for warranty you have to pay every year. Yeah, yeah. that's what really gets me. With like PC for like Windows programs? Yeah, it's becoming less relevant. Yeah, so then one of the key things that applications have to work, that's some sort of weird problem for Mac, and applications work differently when they do work. So. So I think it, it's interesting, as you can see, that Apple doesn't try to address everything. Right? They focus on some high priority things, you know, it's going to look really nice, it's going to have a nice user interface, it might be more secure, and then they're not trying to compete on the cost front at all. You know, so that's why they've got such high profit margins where they make so much money on all their products, so they don't try to do everything. So what do you say, uh, is there a fit? Between you and uh, Apple laptops, anybody <coughs> own an Apple laptop? I've owned several of them. Yeah. Yeah. So there's the product market fit there. So you weigh all these different things, and it's worth the extra money to an Apple. Yeah. When you have the money, fast. Yeah. For me, I've had like three, yeah, three uh, laptops, Apple laptops, and they've lasted. I they do last longer. Though, Twenty they? years, I've been gone through three, so. So as you can see, I mean, um, different products appeal to different customer segments. That's why it's really important to understand your customer segment, to understand who's going to be the target for your product, and to make sure there is a target customer that really wants your product and is going to choose that over the alternative. All right, some more ways to think about this. Each product, there's numerous customers, and they may like the product, they may not. For each individual customer, there's tons of products available. There's tons of product offerings. So you just look at Walmart. All these are different value propositions, you know, that, that are trying to be sold to customers and they're differentiated in some way. Some are for cleaning up pet hair, some are for cleaning up other things. Um, but they're all different um, value propositions targeted at different customers, hoping to differentiate in some way. So as customers, you're constantly overwhelmed by all these different value propositions and you're going to end up buying the ones that communicate it most effectively to you and also resonate with, with what your priorities and what your priorities are and, and what pain and demands you have in your jobs that you're trying to solve. So if you look at laptops, I mean, some people may want Apple, some may want Windows, some may want a Chromebook, which has some differences there. You know, less storage, more cloud-based, less applications, but then for some customer segments that can be appealing. Or you can say somebody just wants to use their phone instead of even having a laptop. You could actually have a, have a desktop instead. Somebody may want to use Linux, and some people may want to just do all their work off of tablets. So all these are different value propositions that are going to resonate with the customer. All right, so um, any recent purchases that addressed your top priorities? Anybody want to talk about their Decision making process, how they chose a specific product they bought recently. Well, I had to get a new smartphone because I was left in the world of uh, yesteryear. And uh, when I upgraded, it's, I ended up getting what is currently LG's flagship phone, but I know that they'll be coming up with a new one pretty quick um, because they're trying to push this one out and get it on sales. But so basically, I wanted accessibility for all the regular tools that I would have as an Android phone. I wanted it to have uh, enough, be new enough that it would still be getting the newest operating systems in a year or so, and be affordable. Um, I didn't really want to pay the six or seven hundred dollars for a new S7, so it met all my criteria. And cool. seems to be. So how do you get through awareness, interest, consideration, purchase? Uh, awareness. Verizon sent me a message saying you're due for an update. <laughs> okay, um, so then you start shopping. Yeah, the, and then. Interest, I actually was just in Best Buy, and I was like, well, I'll see if they have any deals because I know that they have some phones here. And then uh, I considered it whenever they had a, a, a extra hook in it, and they offered a free television with the G5. So Whoa. I went ahead and went for it and got the phone. Not bad. They gave you a free TV? Yeah. yeah free. That's the way to push somebody through that. Free Samsung? Uh, no, it was actually a free uh, LG smart TV. Wow. So hard to argue. When did you buy this phone? <laughs> That's awesome. I mean, uh, I need TV. G5 had to pay 150 for it, so That's it's kind of an wow. honor. 
you know, it's about six months old or so, so it's a little bit much for what they wanted to do on an upgrade. But then you throw on the TV and it was worth it. <laughs> no kidding, man. That's like a paradigm shift for like today. They're good. It's like buy a phone and get a free TV. Yeah. Well, I did that at Christmas. One, I wasn't even shopping for a TV at the time. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Anybody got any other examples? Yeah. Any support TV? All right. I wasn't getting enough dates. <laughs> so I started there. looking into it. I know another Apple. <laughs> Perfect. Um, any questions on the on the process here, value proposition design? All right. Well, some upcoming events. We got Shark Tank coming up in two weeks, on the nineteenth, four to six. We're not gonna have a networking hour that 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 week, but definitely recommend attending Shark Tank. Should be a lot of fun. You can get your tickets at sharktank.nmsu.edu, and it's gonna be all the conventions coming. You said that there is a last pick to fail. Is it? Uh, yeah, our, our pool is getting set, so um, might be able, we might be able to talk, actually, see if there might be room to, to pitch. But, yeah. but um, yeah, we're getting the, the participants finalized. It should be a good one, so definitely get your tickets and check it out. Um, Aggie i is open now through the 17th. Um, this program for a tech-related business um, involving a student, faculty member, and a business mentor. It can provide $2,000 in participant support four-week program really teaches value proposition design so you get a chance to go through this process for your your products uh, outstanding program it's going to start at the end of October um, if you're interested apply at icorps.msu.edu so like, what is it like do we have to come up with some technology kind of thing or like well if you're working on a business and it's got some stem focus um, you can apply and then you get in the program um, you get some training you get the funding and uh, you go and do 30 customer interviews to reach a go or no go decision on your on your business. And then at the end, you talk about what you learned. And uh, from there, there's a lot of follow-on funding opportunities. So that, that might be something to look into. Great program. Also, new this fall is the Aggie Startup Club. If you're interested in joining, it's a, it's a good networking group for people interested in entrepreneurship. You can sign up at uh, the Arrowhead website slash startup. They're meeting every other uh, uh, every other Tuesday, four to five. And then next week we got another networking hour. Um, we're going to continue the Discipline Entrepreneurship Series and talk about um, how does your customer acquire your product. As always, you can subscribe to our events on, on Facebook, and, and now you can see it live on our Facebook account. So that's all I got. Thanks for coming. We'll see you next week.